share a long view of statistics with you. This is not to be memorized. This is not to be regurgitated. This is just to be observed, is all this is right now. Just observe. Ah. <laughs> just, just, just take a look. Take a look. It's a little fuzzy, too. It doesn't blow up well, I've noticed. So if you look at all of what's on the screen right now, what you see are the distributions. So we've learned about probability distributions in this class. We spent like the past three weeks talking about nothing except those. Many of them have special names, a few of which we've been talking about. The uniform distribution, which I believe is called, he's somewhere on here. I found him earlier and I lost him. There he is, right there. You see a standard uniform? Yep, and there's the general uniform right there. There's down there. There are actually special cases of what's called the Bernoulli, which is up here somewhere, up there. So we, we, we mentioned that earlier in class, in general class. And we mentioned it, and that's all it's really worth is just to mention it as you go by. Mention. You're like, oh, this happens to be one of those. Yes, it's very, very cool. We've also mentioned other ones, the binomial, for example. I spent a lot of time last week on that one. He's right there. Eh, right there. Now, I've also mentioned other ones. Here's some applications of the other ones. I got some pictures flying up here. I think they should be. Okay. Oh, there they go. That is an assembly line at a car plant. When they are programming the robots for the assembly lines at car plants, they are actually tied to the geometric distribution. Hello, PowerPoint. Animation should be appearing. There we go. Let's see if they keep going. There we go. So, the geometric distribution, what that one is, you'll actually see it. You don't have to know it, but you'll see it occur in the craps quiz, should you do that one for Thursday. That's the gambler's room quiz. In other words, you might have to play the game of craps a long time to win your dollar back if you keep losing. So essentially, you keep playing craps until you win. It might take one roll, it might take two, it might take three, it might take four, it might take five, and so forth and so on and so forth and so on. But that's a geometric situation. It's not like the binomial where you say, here's 10 bucks, go play 10 games. Geometric goes, take a bunch of money with you, go into Vegas, and don't come back till you have a dollar. That's what, that's what Vegas, that's what geometric distribution would be. It's also used for building cars, robotic arms that put parts on cars. They don't always hit the target, due to any number of reasons. The car could be slightly in the wrong place, the arm could have a glitch in the system, maybe something bumps it on the way. Generally, those arms get a couple tries to get it right. They'll try once, if they get it wrong, they'll come back, recalibrate, try again. If they get it wrong again, they'll come back, recalibrate, and try again. If they get it wrong the fourth, if they get it wrong the third time, they stop the belt, the person runs like, what the hell is going on? And then run back up, and then hopefully that was a that was a goofy, weird event, and the next one goes on just fine. So that's where the geometric distribution actually comes in. And in situations like that, uh, checking forged checks or faulty voting data. How many of you have heard? Voting. Voting was suspect in Ohio, <laughs> or the Iraq Democratic election might not have been democratic, or something like that. You've, you've heard this in the news, right? How do they know that? How do they know voting was rigged in these situations? Well, anybody know the answer to that? Software. So, running what? Love that. Like comparisons of the signatures? Mm. Mm. Oh, that's actually looking at forged <laughs> documents. I thought you meant number. See, the two answers to the software, at least two answers. One is actually checking the signatures versus that. But you can also have a more umbrella look. There's something called a Benford distribution, which is pretty slick, where you can look at the numbers that come in from the various regions, and even the numbers on the actual voting polls themselves. And if they've been forged or forced in any way, they'll deviate far away from what this Benford distribution has. And that's one line of suspect. This is how the Iraq, the Iraq distribution kind of deviated. Sometimes forged checks get caught this way. It's a first line of defense. Like, ooh, ooh, it failed Benford's test. Now let's go in and say, look at the signatures and see if the signatures also fail. If they both fail, it's a pretty good indication that something's going on. So another, another distribution, extraordinarily specific, though, yeah? Extraordinarily specific. Looking at Powerball or that, that game that those kids in New York figured out when they figured out how to make themselves money, that wasn't the binomial. That was the hypergeometric. I actually mentioned that one in class a couple weeks ago, and then you probably started dry heaving, so I stopped talking about it. But the hypergeometric is like the binomial when you can't use the binomial. Now, think about Max and his chicks, right? Max and his chicks. Go buy four girls, or go buy four birds. Let's hope they're all girls, right? He goes in, grabs four, puts them in a box, and brings them home. Technically speaking, that isn't binomial, because what did we do with the birds? We brought them home. 
Right? The binomial, what kind of sampling do you do with a binomial? Technically. With replacement, thank you, Emily. So we're putting them back. But why did we say it was okay with the chicks? Small sample, large population, you can assume independence of the sampling. What if you can't? That's hypergeometric. That's when you only have a small population and you're drawing too large of a chunk from it. That's when you use the hypergeometric. But how often do you do that? How many times do you guys figure the Powerball odds out? Hardly ever. You look at the back of the ticket and there they are. But if you need to do that kind of mathematics, there's a distribution for you. Notice how it's tied to the binomial? I don't know if you can see that right there. It's tied to it, and somewhere up there, if you can see it right, hang on, if I can jump and hit it. I think it's right there. It's got an n going to infinity. n going to infinity, that means, that means the population size is getting larger. Then you can use the binomial. Yay, that's great, that's great. Uh, planning traffic lights. When lights should be green versus red, that's a beautiful use of something called the Poisson distribution. Poisson, uh-huh. <laughs> The light at Wall Street and Newport Avenue. Wall Street and Newport Avenue, I think, is one of the worst lights in this town. I think most of the lights in this town are pretty good. That one defies logic to me. I have sat there. Now, it's right track stand practice. I'm on my bike. Coming down, well, coming down Newport, heading eastbound. Slight uphill. And I, can, I get to that red light, I turn the, I turn the brake sideways and kind of rotate back and forth, staying in the pedals. I've had to stay there for two and three minutes sometimes while that light stays red. There's no traffic, but the light is red. And I don't dare run the red light, because I did that once when I got pulled over on my bike at 4 a.m. We'll still have pictures that right now. So other than that light, I think most of the lights in town are actually timed pretty well. They have the sensors in them, which is great. Bikes, unfortunately, don't, don't trip the sensors unless they're the camera type, which many aren't. But the Poisson distribution is the distribution to use when you're modeling traffic patterns. It governs pretty well what's actually going on. It, it takes the binomial and makes it a little more time dependent. Like for example, the binomial would say 90% of the time you get girls when you grab chicks out of the box. The Poisson would say on average, six cars get through a green light on Wall Street on this certain left-hand turn. On average, six cars get through that green light, which lasts a certain period of time. So you see the slight difference in, 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 in enumeration. One is a percentage, one is an average. And that's neat. They kind of talk about the same thing in two different ways, which is, which is fun. And last but not least, the exponential distribution is a pretty neat way of modeling the behavior and the lifespan of, uh, of computer servers. So I, I've shown you these five examples, not to make you memorize them. I used to actually include all of these in, in Math 243, and I realized that by doing that, I was kind of shooting myself and you guys in our, our, our collective feet. Because I had you doing so many different distributions that you were losing the track of what a distribution even was. Oh crap, it's like, it's like not seeing the forest for the trees. All you see are all these trees and the trees are confusing. So I've been more focused on the forest itself, which is why we took that whole week, two weeks ago, and just did distributions and averaging distributions. That was kind of a wonderful way to go. So rather than focus on this entire chart of distribution, I'm going to go back to a, a clean slate here. The one that we focused on last week was that guy, the binomial. He's the one we love. We love him because he applies it to different places. In Matthew 244, you'll see even more how he does it. But today, I want to talk about a second one called the normal, and his very, very close cousin, the standard normal, which is this guy over here. Now, why would I want to include one more? And we only have two more weeks together. And that's what I want to talk about in those two weeks is that distribution, that normal distribution. Why would I want to talk about a new distribution with two weeks to go? Why? That's what 244 is going to be. Well, two, 244 is, has quite a bit of that, plus other distributions that, that grow out of the normal. But what's the point, though? Overriding, forget 243, forget 244. Just think about the world in general. So, for example, I would mentioned Tower of Terror earlier, right? And, Carolyn, you expressed an interest in it because you said your five-year-old wants to ride one of those rides, yeah? Yeah, we're planning a trip to Disneyland. Well, there you go! Hey, you've been on Tower of Terror. Thing's amazing, isn't it? Wicked, wicked fun. Wicked, wicked fun. That's the ride I discovered if I scream the entire time, I don't get sick. So <laughs> my stomach muscles like, like just clench and hold my stomach in place. So, the binomial. Let's just do a little quick little recap. The binomial probability distribution. When, whether you do it by hand or use technology to do it, what does the distribution actually look like? If you, were, if you had to write out the distribution, which sometimes you have to do, but many times you're using technology to do it. If you use this fill or if you write it out, what does the distribution actually look like? Say that again. Oh, oh, more, 
more fun. Thank you, Emily. Yes, very often it's skewed. Thank you. I mean, more fundamentally than that, if you actually had to draw the graph to get that skewed distribution, what would you have to start with? Thank you for that. Very, very good. Zero. Say that again. Zero. Good. Where, where's zero? Please keep going with that. Start. Yeah. The start of what? I'm picking on Emily. I apologize. Emily, you're giving me great answers. She says it starts with zero. What's the next value? One. One, and then it was, and then, and then it kept going until we got to what? That's a trick question. Until you, until you tell her where to stop. Exactly. So if you tell Max to go by four birds, ten birds, forty-one birds, not to pick on Danielle again. How many birds you got? Good. What was this column here? What were we calling that? Okay. Say it again, nice and loud. Okay. I thought I heard. <laughs> what is that column? X. X. You guys are thinking too hard. That's your random variable. And that random variable could mean anything from the number of times Max gets the shoes on the correct feet to the number of girls we get when he buys the chicks from the store to the number of people in a survey of size 1,000 that say President Barack Obama is doing a, uh, Obama, Obama is doing a crappy job. It's a, no, it's a one or a zero. It's how many people say yes or how many people say no. It's how many girls versus how many boys. It's how many times he gets the shoes on the right feet versus the wrong feet. This is the number of times out of N that that happens. Beautiful. What goes here? Yes, the probabilities of those things happening and those when you plot those, that's where you sometimes get your skew. Thank you, Emily, for that. That's, that's awesome. That's way past what I was looking for. But you do sometimes get skew, and sometimes you don't. Sometimes you don't. For example, when we plotted the chicken distribution, it looked like this for 10 birds. The rooster distribution looked exactly the opposite. Looks like that. But the max distribution, the max distribution with his crocs, <laughs> Looked like that. Remember that? Yeah, because yeah, we, we thought he was guessing he's going to get it right half the time. So the probability being a half, probability being 10%, probability being 90%. Yeah, the distribution kind of follows that. Thank you. Very often skewed, very, very not often perfectly symmetrical. Thank you. We'll, we'll deal with both of those cases in this, the remainder of our time together. Excellent. <laughs> so that's the overview. Actually, I call this binomial. This is really a, more of a general overview about any probability distribution. On what kind of data? On what kind of data? What kind of data did this always apply to? Now, you've got to think way back now. I'm being a little bit of a bastard here. Uh, more, even more general than that, Austin. Even more general than that. What, what kind of data? Data we broke down into, it's numerical, we broke it into two types a long time ago. And we've been going back and forth between them a lot. Say that again. Good. Quantitative had two types. Discrete and continuous. Thank you, brothers and sisters. Here's the deal. Everything we've been doing so far has been discrete. Here's why. Number of times Max gets his shoes on the correct feet. Number of female birds he actually selects. Number of fives we get when we bet on five and chuckle up. Number of games it takes us to win back a dollar in Vegas. Number of dollars, number of dollars I or my heirs receive if I die or become disabled when I buy a life insurance policy. You see how all those things are counted? Every single one of those things is counted. Every single one of those things is counted. So this is what happens. This is, these are the tools you use when you have discrete data. Well, what happens when you have continuous data? <coughs> what happens when you have continuous data? For example, how do we get a probability that talks about how likely it is our kid can ride on the Tower of Terror? To which somebody says, I don't care. He either can or he can't. To which I say, touche. Good answer. <laughs> Anecdote trumps statistics. And I'm not saying it doesn't. I've been told very many times, why do you go to acupuncture for your allergies? Acupuncture's placebo effect. I'm like, acupuncture makes my allergy symptoms go away for at least two weeks. So, <laughs> so that, again, anecdote trumps statistics. I've never seen a statistical study that proves acupuncture works. And I don't care because it works for me. You see what I'm saying? I don't care if it's a placebo effect. It's well worth it if I stop sneezing and scratching my eyes out. But if Disney has to set that bar for the height to not piss off the majority of people, they better understand that kind of a thing. 
And you, as, as potential future Disney employees, as one of many, many, <laughs> as one of many, many future researchers is a better point, you have to understand how those curves work too. Because you're going to be doing things like analyzing nutrition levels of youngsters in an HDFS program, for example. You're going to be looking at IQ scores or test scores for kids in an ECE program. These are all going to be continuous things. Let me share some stuff I've discovered. Because this is, this, is, this is really, really fascinating. I'm not trying to say that Disney is the beginning and the end of the answer, because it's not. But what I want to do is, I want to share with you a fusion of the two worlds of the discrete data and the continuous data. And I want to show you why I only want to focus on that one distribution, which is called that.